Battletech, the giant robot space opera with a library's worth of lore, versus me, on No Pants Day. This can only end so well. All right, nothing to it but to do it. But before we start, I'd like to start it out with three simple words. Fuck Harmony Gold. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. There are certain titans of the industry I don't cover, either because the subject matter is overexposed, or it's merely an area I don't have the right angle to address. For the most part, Battletech is considered one of them. A series about giant robots that presents decades worth of lore and world building, equal parts military science fiction and space opera. That, of course, is underselling the sheer size and complexity of the Battletech universe. While it started out as a miniatures game, expansion of both the game and its lore allowed it to venture into other areas like television, video games, and most importantly, role-playing games. It's done so twice in its tenure, the first being the long-running MechWarrior series, not to be confused with the MechWarrior series of video games, and in 2009, the subject of this review, Battletech, A Time of War. As per my policy, I'll be looking into it without comparing it to MechWarrior. Doing otherwise, frankly, would not be fair, since it had several additions to develop and this one doesn't. However, much like its predecessor, A Time of War intends to be as compatible with the core war game as possible. How does that pan out? Well, let's find out. A Time of War is published by Catalyst, and you can be forgiven for comparing its presentation to that of Shadowruns. However, I'd say they're a little more conservative with their use of color. I do like that a lot of the artwork has a little caption that puts some context in it. You don't see that sort of thing often. Much like in Shadowrun, short fiction is placed between the chapters. In this case, an ongoing story called The Fires of Hell. That said, I do wish there was a bit more art in some chapters, as parts of it can get a bit wall-ish. Plus, given the long history the series has, it stands to reason that we could add in a few breaks to all the text. I suspect that the content might be an issue, but we'll get into that when we get to the end. Character creation relies on one of two systems. The first is life modules, wherein life path like packages are purchased and used to determine the cost of other aspects. The second is the universal method, which is far more freeform and doesn't use modules. Regardless of which one you go with, you have 4,500 experience to start with, 5,000 if you're a clanner. For the sake of simplicity, we'll be going with the life modules approach, in this instance with our young mech warrior named Gino. Before we buy any modules, we spend 850 XP on the Universal XPs. If this sounds confusing, you're not alone. This grants us 100 XP to each attribute, 20 XP in the language skill for the faction's primary language, in this case Japanese, 20 XP on one of the secondary language skills, in this case we're going with English, and 10 XP in the perception skill. For the Stage 0 module, we'll be going with the Draconis Combine and the Azami sub-affiliation. This module costs 150 XP and gives us the following XP benefits. The flexible XPs are boosts that aren't set in stone. In this case, we'll go with 10 XP to melee weapons. For the Stage 1 module that delves into early childhood, we'll spend 215 XP to go with Nobility, as our mech warrior hails from House Kurita. This grants us the Nobility fixed XP and flexible XPs, though we have to make note of the prerequisites for this module. Stage 2 concerns late childhood. In this case, we'll go with Military School, which costs 500 XP. This grants the appropriate fixed and flexible XP. Again, we have to bear in mind the noted prerequisites. Stage 3 concerns Higher Education. This one isn't necessarily required, but can be useful for certain character archetypes. In this case, we'll be going with Military Academy, which has a base cost of 720 XP, with an additional 60 XP cost for taking the basic training and Lechmorier courses. The final stage concerns Adulthood Experiences. In our case, our mech warrior had a tour of duty, which costs 800 XP. This leaves us with 1205 XP to spend, and 720 flexible XP gained over the years with the courses taken in Military Academy. In order to meet the prerequisites, we spend some of the flexible XP on attributes. Thus, we spend 25 XP on strength, 175 on body, 300 on dexterity, 225 on reflexes, and 120 on intelligence. 
This leaves us with the aforementioned 1205 XP to spend, as I mentioned. In pursuit of meeting prerequisites, we'll spend 325 XP on wealth and 100 on property, which covers the remaining prereqs that we didn't cover through the flexible XP. The remaining XP is spent as follows. 60 on connections, 100 on combat sense, minus 150 on the xenophobia compulsion, 100 on equipped, minus 200 on enemy, 85 in fit, 170 in martial arts, 10 on mech gunnery, 145 on mech piloting, 100 in Japanese, 100 in English, and 170 in perception. The final part before calculation is buying equipment. Your starting amount of C bills is determined by your rating in the wealth trait. Since Gino's wealth trait is 4, he starts out with 25,000 C bills. We'll be spending 250 on a katana, 54 on a magnum auto pistol with two clips, 200 on a cooling vest, 9 on a shirt and shorts, 25 on leather boots, 50 on a military communicator, 10 on a basic field kit, 10 on a medical kit, 20 on two medi patches, 16 on eight stim patches, which leaves him with 24,356 C bills. Finally, calculation, as we put everything together and determine the final levels for attributes, traits, and skills. For example, 300 XP in a trait would result in three trait points, while 300 XP in a skill would result in a skill rating of 7. Taking this into account, Gino's XP distribution results in the following. For attributes, he has 1 in strength, 3 in body, 4 in dexterity, 4 in reflexes, 3 in intelligence, 3 in willpower, 2 in charisma, and 1 in edge. For skills, plus 3 in the soldier career, plus 1 in computers, plus 3 in mech gunnery, plus 2 in military history, plus 3 in English, plus 3 in Japanese, plus 1 in leadership, plus 7 in martial arts, plus 2 in meditech, plus 5 in melee weapons, plus 1 in ground navigation, plus 5 in perception, plus 5 in mech piloting, plus 1 in running, plus 1 in sensor operations, plus 3 in small arms, plus 1 in swimming, and plus 1 in land tactics. For traits, he has 1 in equipped, 1 in reputation, 4 in wealth, 1 in connections, 1 in property, 2 in rank, 1 in thick-skinned, minus 2 in house liao hatred, minus 1 in xenophobia, and minus 2 in provincial lord enemy. I'm not 100% confident in either my math or my optimization here, but I went through with it anyways to illustrate a certain point. The XP system is needlessly roundabout. When a non-universal game is reminding me of the big two in Universal, namely Hero and GURPS, there's a problem. I want to note that the character creation system isn't bad on paper, just a no man's land between full flexible and life path. I suppose it's fortunate that the game is generous with pre-generated characters, due to the amount of work involved with character creation. I blame the bulk of this on the XP system and the degree of cross-checking required. Once again, this will tie back into the finale. Like its predecessor, A Time of War aims to have a shared experience with the Battletech Wargame. As such, most roles are determined using 2d6, adding and subtracting modifiers and comparing it to a target number. A natural 12 is considered a critical success that results in an exploding die, and a natural 2 results in a critical failure. The target number isn't necessarily determined by task difficulty. Instead, it depends on the skill's complexity, while the difficulty is a TN modifier. Taking this into account, a simple basic skill has a TN of 6, while an advanced complex skill has a TN of 9. Attribute checks are the highest TNs, being 14 or 21 depending on if it uses one or two attributes. I should note that the average attribute value is assumed to be 4 to 6, since that has a plus 0 modifier. But oddly, the starting value before XP spending is 1. I find that a bit strange for the style of game this wants to be. Much like Shadowrun, Edge is the game's extra effort mechanic, and can be spent before or after the roll. When it's spent before, it adds a modifier to the roll equal to double the points spent. When it's spent after the roll, it can either modify it as if it was spent before, or to force a reroll. Skills are categorized by the required action, either simple or complex, as well as the level of training, either simple or advanced. In addition, some skills are tiered, where it's considered basic at rank 3 or less, and 4 or higher is considered advanced. The core mechanic is fine, but the material surrounding it could be considered a bit of a problem. I understand why it's done in this game, but as I hope to demonstrate in a moment, it's something of a double-edged sword. 
As I said before, a time of war aims to be compatible with the Battletech war game. While it does so admirably, that is both its greatest strength and simultaneously its greatest weakness. In a lot of war games, the target numbers for dice rolls are significantly varied with several subsystems at play. Role-playing games, that's not as prevalent. It exists, but not nearly to the same degree. There's a bit of an expectation that dice rolls will be measured against a set of universal difficulty ratings. A Time of War doesn't really have this, with dice rolls operating under different systems. When I reviewed Shadowrun Anarchy, I said it was to Shadowrun what basic D&D is to advanced D&D. I'd argue that Battletech needs a similar kind of sister game, at least in terms of its RPGs. The die rolling proper isn't bad per se, just something it could see a little odd depending on your player's background. What's truly going to make or break the matter is the character creation. To be honest, I wonder if this would have been easier if they had used something akin to the priority system used in Shadowrun 5th edition. As it stands, character creation has too many steps in its destination and optimization, making it more difficult than it needs to be. All that is not to say that A Time of War is a bad game, just a bewildering one at times. Given the depth in Battletech's lore and mech variety, it's going to be a hard sell for those who aren't already familiar with it. Even then, they might not want to dive into this version of it. As such, the only grade I can give it fairly is Caution. This is going to demand an extremely specific type of players, even more so than Shadowrun. However, if you insist on trying this out, I'd recommend getting the core book and the companion book to take full advantage of what it has to offer. Otherwise, stick to the war game and the video games. It'll be better for your sanity.